So good afternoon, everybody. Everybody have a good lunch. Yeah, you stayed away from anything that's going to give you uh, that postprandial sleepy time, right? <laughs> well, we got a good time to start off with. Dr. Hall here. Uh, Dr. Hall is of such good, such big stature, such well-known renown, that she's actually going to stay seated for the whole talk, so she doesn't block her screen. But a little word about Dr. Hall for any of you who don't know her. Uh, she is right now a, uh, a professor emeritus, which means that, as I said before, she says she's retired, but thank goodness she is just faking it. Um, she originally started off in the East Coast. She went to college at uh, Wesley College, uh, and then from there went on to medical school at the other uh, coast, over at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And then she bounced back again to Baltimore, where she did her internship, a, a med peds internship, many, uh, uh, adult uh, medicine and pediatrics at the same time, and then went off and did genetics all at uh, Johns Hopkins, and decided to bounce back over to Seattle, where she was for about 10 years, uh, doing pediatrics and, uh, and genetics, and also, by the way, there's a little endocrinology mixed in there, she just informed me. Uh, and then, after a bit of that, she got bored and went off to Vancouver. She's been there, she was there and practiced for 20 years. 20 years? Right. Uh, okay, 20, 35, you know what's the difference. <laughs> and she continues to be very active in our community, and thank goodness we hope that she will continue to do that for many, many years to come. Uh, she's got a great talk in mind. I can actually take a front row seat so I can watch the whole thing myself, and I'm turning over the mic now. Thank you so much. So I'm glad to be here. But you'll notice I've been practicing with sticks, and so I'm very sympathetic to you, all of our young people who end up needing sticks or wheelchairs for the first time. Anyhow, um, it's just a pleasure to be back. And I thought, since I was asked to talk, that I give a talk that's slightly for newcomers who are still trying to slightly for newcomers who are trying to understand arthritis and haven't yet um, actually figured out how to spell it. Um, so what I thought I'd do was talk about what's new. Um, and um, it's gotten very complicated. So I'll try to make it simple. Um, but I'm so pleased and honored, and thank you very much for being uh, by me. And I'm totally blown away with this morning. So it's lovely to see old and new faces, and um, I should say this has been a very long-standing um, area of interest for me, at least 40 plus years, so that was before most of you were born. Um, and what I thought I'd do was give you um, an outline, supposedly in the new realm of teaching, you're supposed to give an outline of what you're going to talk about. Um, and for those newcomers, I talk about definition and frequency, um, and then it's a sign. It's not a diagnosis. And last time I counted, there were 400 specific types of arthrogryposis, so nobody can remember all those. Um, and I will make the point that getting a specific diagnosis is really useful, um, and if you don't have one, um, how to go about getting one. And then what I'll do is talk a little bit historically about what's been happening. Um, clinically and new molecular pathways and potential therapies. So let's start with the definition. And an equally useful term are multiple congenital contractures. In other words, two or more contractures in different body areas. So puffy is not arthrogryposis. And the term, which is really, it turns out to be uh, a hodgepodge of Greek and, and um, Latin, means joint curved or bent um, condition. So arthrogryposis is multiple congenital contractures. Well, contractures are actually pretty common. One in 500 babies has a foot, oh, one in 200 to one in 500 condone dislocated hips. Multiple congenital contractures, one in 3,000. So if you put them all together, about one in 100 babies have contractures. Now, how frequent is multiple congenital contractions, arthroposis? There have been many studies, but the bottom line is it's about one in three hundred, excuse me, one in three thousand. 
that is actually kind of one of three thousand is um, still is considered a rare disorder. And I highlight that for you because there's money or research in rare disorders. And their rare disorders disorders have band together to try and actually get some respect. Um, so keep your eye out for rare disorder kinds of funding and um, processes. So I'm going to show you a set of pictures of babies. And what you'll see is they come in every shape and set of contractures. I do have permission to show all these pictures from their parents. But you can be flexed, you can be extended, you can have a curvature of your back, you can be extended um, with contract with flexion in other areas, and you can be a stillborn. Now, I point out the stillborn because probably uh, about one sixth of all babies with arthroposis actually are stillborn. And I'll, what I'll come to a little bit later is the fact that if you don't move in utero, your lungs don't go. You have to breathe in utero to exercise your lungs. And if you're not moving, you're often not breathing. So, arthroposis is actually not a diagnosis. And that's important for you to know because your doctor won't know. Well, that's not true. There's some doctors that know. It's a sign. And it's a sign, in other words, it's an observed thing that there are multiple congenital contractures. So, arthroposis for the biologist, for the curious person, is really interesting because it has to do with why we move. In other words, it happens in all of those 400 plus cases. Because baby doesn't move in utero. So when do you start to move? What makes you move? How does that work? That's what's so interesting and what we're really trying to figure out. Because what we want is to be able to treat it in many different ways. So why does it happen? Well, it can be a muscle process. It can be the muscle connecting to the nerve process. It could be because there's a vascular problem. It could be because it's a connective tissue problem. It could be a metabolic problem. It could be an illness mother has or an exposure she has. It can be because there's not enough space to move. It can be because it's a neurologic problem. And all of those are limitations in fetal joint movement. So the embryo is when you're forming things. And the fetus is when things are being tried out to get ready for being born. And in all of those cases, because the fetus isn't moving, then you end up with contractures. And I'll later on tell you, what? What does that mean? What else do we need to learn about? So there are many ways to approach the diagnosis. You can group things into muscle or tendon or vascular problems. And each of those will have a biochemical pathway that we're trying to understand. So what's necessary to actually move? What does it take? Well, it takes your central nervous system being intact, your spinal cord, the cells in the spinal cord that connect to the muscle, the myelin along that, that nerve, the end plate where it connects to the muscle, tendons, joints, all of those things have to be in place and working. And just to put that in perspective, there are at least 300 different kinds of cells in the body. And in those processes, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of cells. And when I talk a little bit later about stem cell therapy, it's understanding how each of those 300 cells mature and what it takes to make them mature. So for each one of these, there are a whole bunch of things that need to go right. But movement is absolutely fundamental to all living beings. In other words, plants, animals, they all move. And the question is when and how and why does it start? And what could be going wrong that it isn't working? So in animals, 
Philo Echinacea, that is the fetus not moving, is actually kind of disastrous because what happens is a whole bunch of things secondarily happen if you don't move. This is an animal study. There have been a whole bunch of animal studies. These are baby rats. These are babies where rats where the extra fluid was taken out so they couldn't move. Well, look what happens. You end up with short limbs and undergrown. And so what we know is fetal akinesia, that is, if you don't move, the akinesia, deformation is a whole set of secondary things that happen if you don't move. You don't grow. You simply don't grow in a normal way. You end up with contractures of the limbs. You have undeveloped lungs. And so if you haven't moved at all, you simply can't breathe after you're born. You have a short umbilical cord, and you have undeveloped intestines. So you have what's called short gut, gut syndrome, but you also often get extra fluid because the fluid around the baby, baby is swallowing in order to mature the gut. And so if your baby had feeding problems, it's because it wasn't actually getting that gut mature. But there are also craniofacial changes that occur. So, for instance, there's underdevelopment of the jaw. If you're not swallowing and moving and smiling and grimacing, the jaw doesn't develop. And that can lead to cleft palate. There's a high bridge to the nose. You don't think of a baby's nose as being a little button nose because it's been smiling and swallowing. But it turns out that it needs that movement. And you have a depressed tip of the nose because the face needs to move to make that develop in a normal way. So future care or fetal amnesia, all of those changes are secondary to baby not moving. Now in arthropsis, we think primarily of the limbs, but there could be all of those secondary things, and they can be what we would call intrinsic. That is, within the embryo fetus itself, or something in the environment, or extrinsic, not enough space. And we think of those as then leading to secondary kinds of effects. And part of that is trying to get a handle on how is it that we think about arthrogyposis. So lack of normal mechanical forces lead to deformations, secondary kinds of things, in every single organ in the body. And part of studying movement is to try and understand what those effects are. So the challenge is to determine what things are primary or secondary or tertiary, and then think about how we go about bringing them back to the normal range. So in the utero, in the uterus, during the pregnancy, use or movement is essential for the normal development of all of those structures. So the secondary effects of lack of movement are short limbs contractures with extra connective tissue around the joint. Why does that happen? What is going on? Well, it turns out, if any of us stop moving, if you break your arm and get put into plaster, then what happens is you'll get extra connective tissue, and you'll be stiff when that um, cast is taken off. So this is like a fundamental process, not only in the fetus, but later in life. But we haven't a clue about how it happens. But there will be abnormal relationships between the bones and the joint. So the joints will be at odd angles or squared off. And then the muscle needs to be used. If muscle isn't used, it atrophies. Oh, why does that happen? So there'll be decreased mass, but understanding the fundamental processes is still really a challenge. If you don't move, then the skin lies right over the joint and you get a dimple. Well, lots of us have dimples at our elbows. The kids with the amyoplasia have dimples all over the place. And that's what skin does when it's not moving. So the other changes, the lungs, the gut, craniofacial, these are all secondary effects to not moving. So, how do we think about our 
hypnosis. Well, what we've learned over time is that if it's one in 3,000 births, then a third of those only involve the limbs. A third of them involve limbs plus other body areas. And a third have central nervous system dysfunction, so intellectual disability. And again, the approaches to that are to look at the specifics within those areas. So as a clinician, say, okay, I've got mainly limbs, and which of these different disorders is it? One of the real challenges is this group over here with limbs plus central nervous system dysfunction in terms of really understanding what's going on. So let me get myself organized here. And much of that has to do with what's happened in genetics. But that last group is really a challenge to the geneticists because most of the disorders in the intellectual disability group are genetic. In 2004, the human genome was completed. In other words, we figured out what are the genes that humans have. And there were some big surprises. First of all, there are in your body 200,000 proteins, but only 22,000 genes. So one gene can make several different proteins. And those of you who are biolog biologically inclined know that genes are little bits and pieces, and they can be read in parts. And so the one gene can make many, maybe 20 different proteins by using different parts of the same gene. Uh, how does that work? Well, it works because less than 2% of the whole genome are actually genes. The rest of it has to do with controlling, turning on and off, different parts of the gene at different times during development. You are kidding me. Is this complex or what? And what I'll say later is that at different stages of the embryo, fetus, newborn, child, young child, older child, different physiologies are present. In other words, different genes are being expressed. Huh? This is so wonderfully complex. But what does that have to do with movement? Well, the embryo fetus's movement is different from what happens later. And what's really fun is how much we are like other animals. We're 90% the same as mice. Huh? But that means we can study mice to understand how things work in humans. You are 99.9% .9 the same as the person next to you. 0.1% difference. I mean, I can tell your difference. But we are so much the same. So the good news is, if we can understand the basic pathways, we can start to understand how these various disorders are working and how we should be doing things. So, at least 20% of our genome, that is what humans have, are differences in the number of genes that you actually have. Makes it a little complex to do your genome, but we kind of come to work with it. But there are 100 changes between you and your parents. We think we're 50% the same as our mom, 50% the same as our No, 100 mutations. And five of those could be something bad. So it's happening all the time. And the bottom line is, there is no such thing as a normal human being. And I'd like you to take that to heart. So there's no reason that is since 2004 developments. And that is the genes are part of pathways or networks or systems. So there are a set of genes that have to do with housekeeping, getting rid of waste, respirating, energy. There are another set of genes that have to do primarily with skin, another set with the heart, another set. So there's some specific pathways related to specific things. So 22,000 genes, and there are probably 20 genes in a pathway, 1,000 pathways. 
Well, actually, you can start to get your head around a thousand pathways. And you can start to say, what's the pathway that I care about that has to do with moving? And each of those pathways have what this business called alternative splice C is that you can get from one spot to another a whole bunch of different ways. And that's what it's all about with pathways. If you're missing one station, you don't go there. You go around to another station. And so if we think of that in terms of these are the genes, 400 genes, which ones are missing? There's some key genes that it's hard to get around. But there are lots of them that you can get around if we can figure out how the physiology of those genes is working. So in this genome oncology analysis, Jack has done this sort of club things together. And when you see them come together, you can say, oh my goodness, if that one in the middle is working, I can get around that. I can find a new pathway to being able to make stuff work. So what's, why is it important for you to get a specific diagnosis? Well, one is for the future. Because in the future, what you're going to want to be able to do is to think about, is this something that can be treated? But right now, if you have a specific diagnosis, we can talk about what's the risk of this happening in your family again? And is anybody else in the family at risk for this happening again? We can predict the natural history. So once there are five or six or seven cases with that same mutation, geneticists try to put it together and look at what happens over time and what things work and what things don't work. You can avoid going on with a hundred other diagnostic tests. And we call it a diagnostic odyssey, where you have thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tests and nothing comes up. And so making a specific diagnosis means you've got the answer. Doesn't necessarily mean you've got treatment, because as many of you know, the treatment's pretty much not exactly the same, but Need a team of people, the orthopedists, the OT, the PT, school specialists. You need a team to help you, but they've got the experience. I think the fourth reason, which is to avoid maternal guilt, is really important. Mom always feels like, oh, if only she had done something different. And it's not true, but anyhow. I feel very strongly for moms. They need to have that reassurance. But isn't this one of the reasons? Is to connect with other families. And since, in fact, arthroposis is still all come together, connecting with other similarly affected families is terrific. And if by chance it's something in the environment, avoid that next time if you possibly can. So if you haven't been to see your friendly geneticist, um, arrange for it. It's really worth the trip. And if you haven't been for a couple of years, lots has happened. 400 specific genes. So go see your friendly geneticist. So again, there's certain disorders that are relatively frequent, and it's relatively easy to find um, somebody in the same category. But the reason I'm showing you this list is actually to concentrate on the fact that the, the pathways in those specific diagnoses will be the same. The one I want to talk about are the myasthenia syndromes. There are a bunch of myasthenia syndromes where muscles are not working properly. And they're very much related to either antibodies against the neuroreceptors. So in myasthenia gravis, it's a well-known autoimmune disorder, and there's a treatment readily available and occasionally, if mom has it, then the antibodies can cross across to the fetus. But what I really want to talk about is the last group, where the genes have been found. And in one of those disorders called Escobar syndrome, the genes are related to the embryonic neuroreceptor. That is, the receptor on the muscle that receives the nerve impulse that says move. 
And what happens in Escobar is the embryonic neuroreceptor has four genes that are only expressed in the embryo and then are replaced by adult genes. Well, it turns out that those genes get turned off at birth and the adult genes get turned on. So what's happening is the impulse is coming down the spinal cord and it's going out to the muscle. And here's the receptor. And you see those four little guys? Those four little guys are very specific um, embryonic neuroreceptors that will be exchanged. A new gene will be expressed when it right around birth. So here are the way it actually looks. But both multiple trigium lethal and Escobar syndrome are defects in them. And so in animal studies, what they did was to treat them with the treatment for myasthenia gravis. Wake up the adult gene. Get it working. And the disorder is almost cured. So these, oh, that's how complicated it is. So these were kids that used to die at age 20. And now they're 30 to 70 percent improved by waking up their adult gene, giving it to function, and you basically are curing what used to be a lethal condition. So my hope is that as we start to understand different pathways, we can use adult genes, fetal genes, replace things, get stuff going. And I don't think it's a pipe dream. I think it will really happen in the next while. So the principle of clinical genetics is that if you understand the pathway, it will be possible to circumvent the missing component. And there may already be a drug available. So one of the wonderful things that's happening in genetics is there are drugs that are available that are now being used for other disorders than that they were developed for. So I really want to leave you all with a sense of hope that the more we learn, the more there's a chance we can go back and correct some things. So I feel very optimistic about the future. But I want to tell you about one more thing that really, really bugs me, and that's prenatal diagnosis. So when you do a prenatal diagnosis, you have to look for movement. And what we know is that most prenatal diagnosis is just measure the size of the head, measure the length of the bone, and it doesn't look for movement. If you really want to look at movement, you need to do 45 minutes, and they usually do 10. So we did a study 19, of cases since 1990 when prenatal ultrasound became standard. And what we found was that 75% of amyoplasia, four limbs, severe amyoplasia, was not diagnosed. I think that's just horrible because it doesn't give families or doctors options. So I presented this to a bunch of obstetricians, and they said, oh, no, 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 that's old stuff. So I did another study in 2010 and showed no improvement. And granted, I get unusual cases and all that, but these were four men in my aplasia, and 75% had not been diagnosed. So um, the real problem is, what can we do about that? Well, one of the reasons that, let me just, did I miss a slide here? Um, what makes babies move? Well, why you'd like to know that baby has contractures is because you like to do intrauterine physical therapy. You like to get that baby moving as much as it can. What makes baby move? Mom moving. If mom's out there going for a walk, baby wakes up and starts kicking. Mom's doing her Tai Chi. Baby says, I'm going to do Tai Chi. So mom moving makes baby move. When mom stops and takes deep breaths, it turns out baby moves. And when mom drinks caffeine, it doesn't just wake her up, 
the rates that they yield to. We do not recommend caffeine in the first trimester. So if there is a pregnancy where there are contractures, we're now recommending that moms go for a walk twice a day. If she, they do Chai Chi, do it twice a day. Deep breathe, stop and take deep breaths and have a glass of coffee, tea, or Coke, or something I put on, with caffeine three times a day. Now, we don't think that's any harm. We don't want to do them any harm. But in familial cases of arthroposis, when in the second affected pregnancy they've done these things, they think that there's an improvement by comparison. So in terms of ultrasound, you can see a club foot as early as 12 weeks, actually. And if you look at baby and the ultrasound of baby, you can see that you can see those things. And if you looked at them long enough, you should be able to see them move. And the failure to do prenatal diagnosis denies the family a physician of options. The family choices in terms of whether to continue the pregnancy, the physician in terms of where to deliver, and how to avoid the harm. And it may be possible to increase movement, but whatever the case, it means that there should be delivery at a tertiary care institution. So why is it important to make a specific diagnosis, well, so you can provide your current risk, predict the natural history, avoid the diagnostic odyssey, relieve mom's guilt, connect families, and avoid environmental. So I urge you all, if you don't have a specific diagnosis, to see your friendly geneticist. Again, just to reiterate, movement is fundamental to living beings. We don't really, we do understand that it starts, and I'll say something about that in a moment. But not moving is a disaster. And not moving affects multiple tissues. And I mean, it's actually really fascinating. Why does that happen? Now, I want to point out that there are many, many stages in human development. And most of all research and physiology has been done on adults. But we know that completely different genes express before implantation, before the embryo actually implants the uterus, then a bunch of different ones occur while the baby is developing specific tissues. And then as the fetus starts to move and try out those tissues, different set. And then later, when the baby is actually viable, a different set of genes and proteins and processes and then the newborn has to get on its own, set up a whole bunch of things. The biochemistry changes, and we don't yet understand it. We know that children respond to drugs differently. We know they get a bunch of different diseases. Guess why? They're using different genes. So we need to really push for better understanding of the stages of development. And what about movement? Well, the first sign of movement is at four weeks, the heart starts to beat. And that's a pretty important muscle, the heart. And for heaven's sakes, it keeps beating the whole rest of your life. And then, about five to six weeks, the head is a trying to start to wiggle again. And then at seven weeks, the shoulders start to shrug if you, if you watch for the movement. And then at eight weeks, the baby starts trying to breathe, even though the larynx is not even open yet. So the diaphragm starts contracting. And the jaw starts to move at eight weeks. So then at nine weeks, the upper limbs, at 10 weeks, the lower arms, the hips, at 11, the lower limbs, and at 12, the hands open and the ankles start to move around. And it happens in a cranial caudal from the top to the bottom direction. The upper limbs move before the lower limbs. The right side is several days ahead of the left side, except in a left-handed person, of course. And that requires that a lot of stuff is intact. The nerve, the end plate, the muscle, all that has to be functioning. And the limbs start to move at about eight weeks. So the timing is that limbs form from six to eight weeks. And in, in arthroposis, the limbs are formed. 
So this is something that happens later, after things are formed. Thin reflection and those creases in your fingers are there by 14 weeks. So the window of effect is between 8 and 14 weeks. There are cases of arthroposis related to trauma. And so we can also talk in terms of at what stage things happen. If the trauma is at eight weeks, there's limitation of job opening. So the very top of this whole process starts at eight weeks. If the trauma is at nine weeks, just the upper limbs are involved. Ten weeks, both upper and lower limbs. So we can start to get a real sense about when movement should be happening. Let me say it again. Arthrogonchosis is not a diagnosis, it's a sign. But the study of arthrogonchosis is all about the importance of embryonic and fetal movement, all the genes and all the processes there are from. And the more we study it, the more that there's promise of therapy and going back and re-challenging it. So there's some really interesting, weird stuff. Like, the earlier you stop moving, the more severe. Like, you don't have normal growth if you're not moving. Like, the joint is weird if you haven't moved. Like, there's short limbs, and there's osteoporosis. You have to use the limb for it to have a normal amount of calcium. This thickening of the capsule of the joint, what is that about? Why did that happen? Is it evolutionary? Can we understand it? Could we find a way to reverse it? Dimples over the skin? Well, some dimples are cute, but I mean, what is that about? Why is it happening? And if you don't move your elbows early, you get a web across them? Yeah. Like, what's the skin doing? Doesn't it know me better? So, um, if you don't use the muscles, the atrophy, could we reverse that? Could we figure out a way to make those muscles stay strong? And why do those limbs try to return to the position you were born with? The poor orthopedists have to keep trying to put them back. But, but they want to go back to that way they were in utero. And what's this three to four month period right when you're born? It's like there's still some stuff turned on that turns on. So there's some wonderful questions. And what we really need to do, and I hope all of you agree, is support all kinds of research on therapy and prevention and um, early getting the healthcare system to really use this new thing. So how do you maintain components? Well, let me give you the example of spinal muscular atrophy. It occurs because the anterior horn cells don't get maintained. Huh? So as you're developing, you have anterior horn cells, and then they have to grow big, and then there's a chemical that maintains them big. What's that have to do with arthrogryposis? It has to do with maintaining your muscle, maintaining your nerves, maintaining your myelin. There are a whole bunch of cytokines, that is, things that make tissues grow, that we are starting to understand. And what we really need to do is understand how all those things happen so that they, we can maintain the tissues. Because that's the future of stem cell research. In arthroposis, you're going to need to make muscle and nerve and end plate and get it to stay there after it's been formed. So we need a lot of research to think about using stem cell to grow new tissues. This is just a, a lovely little drawing that I made of a stem cell that differentiates into different kinds of tissue. And it does that because genes express that tell those tissues become a nerve, stay a nerve, become an anterior horn cell, and stay an anterior horn cell. So there are a whole bunch of potential therapies that are just waiting to be discovered but also where we avoid scarring, where we use specific growth factors and use regenerative therapies. There are some fantastic things going on right now. I hope you're all aware that Shriners Hospitals have been really supporting arthrogryposis. 
So the Charter Hospitals in Canada have developed a registry of young yeah, children. I hope you will all sign up for it. Um, in Vancouver, we've developed a registry of adults, and we're able to say from 28 countries and 200 adults with arthrogrosis, they are able to be independent, have jobs, get married, about 50% more than spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, and neural tube defects. But we want to learn more. So we need you, with whatever your unusual things are, to sign up to be part of these studies. But also possible genetic studies. And what's happening is people with specific mutations all over the world are collaborating. I just heard about a group of 30 people with a very rare gene we're all going to Dubai because there's a rich Saudi person with this gene problem. But so they can collaborate and learn more. Well, not every group will have a rich Saudi person. But they can communicate in this day and age. And it's just an amazing time for these possible things. So I encourage all of you to take part in those opportunities. So I do want to just close with um, another plug for the book. You were so generous to allow us to talk about the 20th anniversary. I'm amazed, honestly, that it's still so timely. But I think there will be a time where the groups that are really interested in arthroposis will write a new book with a team collaboration. And if you do download it, you'll find that there's so many different kinds of inputs that give you ideas about how to talk to your school and older sisters. So let me just close by saying Mother Nature is very clever. She tests things out way back in the times of dinosaurs and then reuses the good pathways in new and additional ways. And she's built in the ability to adjust to new environments. So our challenge as physicians, biologists, researchers is to work with Mother Nature to achieve, achieve optimum health for all of us. Because nobody's known. So I tried to cover the definition, the types of arthroposis, give you a sense about history, but also how important and interesting movement is. I want to thank my collaborators, the institutions at which I've worked, the families and patients, and the wonderful AMC support group organization. Just a remarkable group. And to tell you that the future is very bright in genetics, a little weird, that it is bright. Thank you. So I know I was supposed to finish in time for questions. Um, we're sort of learning, but I, can I take a couple questions? Yes? Can you clarify the research that you found with the, using the medication for myasthenia gravis and um, So the question was whether I could clarify the research using the medication for myasthenia gravis. I just want to say it only works in ESPA. It shouldn't be used in anything else. And part of showing that weird sign with all this, that other things was you don't want to use it and it could be a problem in other disorders. So you need a specific diagnosis of Escobar, which is an embryonic defect. But the principle that you can use an adult gene to correct something that went wrong during embryogenesis, and for adult disorders, use embryonic genes to correct things. It's one of the really exciting parts of, um, I think, genetics today. So great care, it should only be used in very specific, shouldn't be tried in anything else. So yes, so the question is where should you go? I'd like to think that the geneticists and all institutions would get you to the right place. It would be a neurologist that would treat you. Um, and the neurologists do know about all of the myasthenia syndromes. Other question? Yes? I've um, in terms of arthroposis is interesting because it's not really a rare disease. It's not like a single big, single gene disease, right? It's one of these complex ones. And it's kind of all of these complex disorders you see more and more genes, you see these bigger lists. And so under four hundred genes, I assume that was just performing the literature and so forth, right? Um, like how does uh, a disability like ours that's actually a complex genetic disease? fit into the rare disease from a funding perspective. 
So the question has to do with how is it that arthrogenosis is a rare disorder? So if you put together all of those genes, it's still one in 3,000, and a rare disorder is considered a rare disorder if it's one in 2,000. Um, rarer than one in 2,000. So you can blame it. But there's so, there are a whole bunch of subgroups as well. And in the rare diseases community, they're really interested in subgroups. So NIH has a very specific program to diagnose rare disorders. And um, if you don't have your genome done but you want it, you can get referred properly to NIH rare diseases. But I think the real point is many funding agencies want to use genetics. And I, again, would like to um, congratulate Schreiner. Schreiner is beginning to think that this is really something they can do. And so I, I think um, many, when you have a rare situation, you look to many different potential funders. Um, muscular dystrophy has, in the past, funded neurologic types and muscle types of uh, arthroposis. So since they've got muscular dystrophy, the common type really nailed now, um, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to approach them about thinking about helping to sort out um, that arthroposis, because it is a spinal muscular problem. So I think 
I couldn't quite hear, but I think you were saying that your orthopedist wasn't sure what was going on. No, I, I, there are orthopedic surgeons that don't seem to have a lot of arthritis experience. You all the geneticists have a handful of surgeons that have had a So, so then your question is, how knowledgeable are geneticists? Because some orthopedists really don't understand arthritis. <laughs> The answer is, of course not. That some of them haven't got a clue, but they then like me. <laughs> and, and, and as Harold said this morning, I used to get, I, 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 my uh, byline says, I don't take consults anymore because I just get a, a, a consult a day. And I simply can't answer them all. But I do think in the genetics meetings, they're starting to have things on our hypothesis and certainly publications, so they should be aware. But I also think the more fundamental question is one of how do we get expert clinics? How, do, how does a region develop expert clinics? And I was so delighted this morning to see that you are getting organized regionally. And I think what that means is you can start to appreciate that some clinics, some orthopedists have a fair amount of experience. And similarly, some geneticist in your area is either willing to really research things or does have experience. So I can tell you that we've published our paper on um, gene ontology, so it's available. They just have to go to the web and find it. Um, but that's the case with Africa Arthroposis, for heaven's sakes. There's zillions of articles in the orthopedic literature about Africa Arthroposis. I do think that as we get noisy, and as you all get noisy in your area, and you demand that there be more expertise, they'll have local groups meeting, they'll invite Harold to come in and talk. Um, I think things will start to improve. But that's the beauty of a parent support group, is it can start to, for this rare disorder, start to demand better knowledge. So I urge you to be obnoxious. <laughs>